Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Honor the Feminine podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Ledford, and today we have the amazing Maya Toll with us. We're starting a little differently. We're going to start with an oracle card today from the Dreams of Gaia Tarot. So actually, it's a tarot card. But we are starting today with the Seven of Air. And he comes to us as a reminder of kindness and kindness to ourself as we see ourselves differently and embrace our shadow. So with that, we'll jump in with Maya Toll today. Maya, welcome. Thanks for having me. This is this is exciting. It is. Yeah. And, and you're my first interview for this new space we're jumping into with the podcast. So I'm excited to do that with you. Do you want to talk about your new space a little bit? Well, we're yeah, so we're we're pivoting to be more more raw and more vulnerable and more um spontaneous actually. Mm, I'm perfect for that. <laughs> I can do that with you. (laughs) (laughs) And really being more open to embracing it all, you know, the shadow and the light, the divine masculine and the divine feminine as they dance. Um, Yeah. And so it feels exciting to have you here with us to jump off. Perfect. Perfect. I, you know, one of the things that's always been a little bit of a pet peeve of mine is the whole, like, be in the light, go for the light. It's so one-sided in, you know, in my training, there's always the yin and the yang. There's always the moon and the sun. There's always day and night. So I love that you're really rounding out and embracing shadow and embracing, you know, both the masculine and the feminine. It's, it's fabulous. I get snarky around go for the light. (laughs) You know, I had um, Cater Brown share a fable with me last year that really resonated. And it was this man was put down into a hole and he had to get out this deep hole and they put a rock on the top and he could see a sliver of light. Mm. So he was digging and digging and digging to try and build up enough dirt to like get to that light. And he dies in the process. And the funny thing is, is that if he had walked into the darkness, there was a tunnel that took him right out of that hole. Right. Yeah. And somehow that spiraled that into my body in a new way to embody it differently. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Someone someone posted on my website recently um, a phrase that they'd found it was a quote and it was a quote from someone named Maya and there was no last name. And it said something like, you know, you have to go deeper into the woods. And this person wrote to me and said, is this you? And, you know, I wrote back, I was like, I don't know. I've said so many things in the, you know, the past decade of having kind of a very public life. Um, Sounds like something I would say, but yeah, I think sometimes we're so busy focusing on the light that we we forget that we have to traverse the darkness to get back to the light. And and over and over again, you know, it's not a one stop deal. Like we keep doing it. This is the sacred spiral. Yeah, that's also become clearer to me and giving up that. But I've already been here and dealt with that. Yes. You know? You know, I like to picture it almost as one of those like spiral staircases. So we get to the same place again, but we're different. And so we can look at the same situation in a different way. And this is why I tell my, my, my little tribe that, you know, we do the same work over and over again every year. It's not about finding new work. It's about finding new depth in the same work. I love that. I love that. Yeah. It's, so, it's a hard thing, I think, for us as modern day Americans to sink into because do you remember timelines when you were in school? You'd put a dot at one end, you'd draw a line, and put a dot at the other end. We're, we're taught to see time on a timeline as a straight line. We're not taught to see time as a cycle or a spiral. And so it's, for many people, a whole new concept. That time is spiraling. And, you know, you're revisiting 
the same place over and over again. And that's okay. That's the way it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I often talk about when I let go of the linear, you know, from like, mm-hmm. I'm going to go to university and law school and be a corporate lawyer. When I blew that open and gave myself some space to what I call zig and zag, that's mm-hmm. when I got happier. That's when I yeah. felt more freedom. Amen, sister. Yeah. 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 Whew. <laughs> so you and I have been um, dancing around surrender and what it really means. Can we dive into that a little? Absolutely. Do you want to kind of let everyone know how we how we got on this conversation? Yeah. Um, so my word for this year, my intention t- for this year, for 2018, is surrender. And so as Maya and I were starting to talk and dance around that, um, there were times when I was giving up corporate lawyering and being out in the world where I really was at a point of surrendering everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and now there's been this, this, uh, this push pull and this dance between surrendering more as a vessel for the messages that are for me and, and moving on those and being more open to them. And that's the sort of surrender part. But there's been this idea that if I don't do that fully and a hundred percent, that I'm not actually surrendering. But as I feel in, there's a couple of things that I'm letting spirit know I'm not ready to surrender. You know, my husband and my daughter, I am I would like them to come along for the ride and I'm not at a point of surrendering them. Right. And what came through was they're the chosen ones. That's what spirit gave back. That's what my guides get back. They're the chosen ones. They chose to do this with you as you chose to do this with them. Yeah. And in that, and it, I surrendered more. Mm, and I, I love that. And, you know, when we were talking about this last week, one of the things that that I love about that is you stepped up and said, this is what I can do. This is what I can't do. And it's interesting because – you know, one of the first things I learned a long time ago when I kind of embarked on this, um, it's like self priestessing, isn't it? It's not having an intermediary between you and spirit. Um, one of the things that I, that I learned was sometimes you've got to be firm (laughs) with the spirit world because, you know, it's easy to forget that we're in a human vessel. And so lessons can come in a way that are either painful or incomprehensible or detrimental to life. Um, and so I learned to be really clear about how I could receive messages, what was okay and what wasn't. Um, and I, I think this is really important because when I was a, a kid, I would hear voices and often they sounded like a record being played at the wrong speed. It was this like me, 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 chatter. And right. And, you know, I, I wondered as I got older, if I'd imagined it, but I, I've asked my mom and she's like, no, you used to come into our room and say, make it stop, you know? And it, it in my memory, it's, it sounds like the way you would picture like elves speaking or something like just like, or fairies, like this crazy high pitch, like vibration that I couldn't really catch any information from. And so it just freaked me out. And so at a fairly young age, I was like, yeah, no more of that. And that stopped. Um, and so as an adult, I learned to be really clear, like, yeah, you, you can kind of send the messages in this way, but not that way. I need the messages in a way that I'm going to understand. And I always felt very, um, I don't, I don't know what the word is. Like it felt okay and right to put those parameters on because otherwise I, how could I respond to anything if I didn't understand what it was I was hearing or taking in? Um, but when it comes to surrender, I never thought to put any other parameters around it other than I need to understand. 
I, like I need to be able to comprehend the information that's coming in. So it was really fascinating to hear you talking about putting some parameters like, okay, I surrender. And it reminds me a little bit of when I've taken new jobs where I already have some things in place in my life. It's like, I'd love to accept your job offer. And I'm on vacation from April 20th <laughs> to the 27th. <laughs> Note that now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was really fascinated with it because I've done the complete surrender. Um, the house goes, the job goes, the car goes, yep. everything goes. And it was amazing. I mean, I had um, an incredibly formative year. I, I went to Ireland and I studied with a traditional healer there for a year. I lived with her. It was, you know, a chop wood, um, carry water kind of apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. And it, it only could have happened through giving everything else up. Like that, that was what created the, you know, the financial place for me to be able to, to do that. Yeah. yeah. But it's also put me in a position of being like, yeah, I'm not doing that again. Cause I'm not right. I'm not willing to go all the way down to bare bones, nothing. Um, I built some things that I care deeply about, um, including my relationship with my business partner and husband. Um, so not so willing to say, Anything you want is yours. Take it away. Yeah. Yeah. And as we started to have this discussion, you brought this beautiful idea around actually rather than surrender in this traditional way that we've been talking where you're willing to give up anything and everything, that really we were talking about co-creation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that that's a, that's a slightly different thought, right? Yeah. To me, it's, you know, surrender is still that um, thy will, not my will. And what's beautiful about that is, I mean, that's like, a, it's complete surrender. Thy will, not my will. Um, but it's also the relationship that a child has with a parent. It's, it's not a partnership. And so I love this idea of co-creating like, hey, there's some stuff that needs to be done, <laughs> universe. How are we going to how are we going to do this together? Right. And I think that's exactly what you were doing when you were saying like, OK, I'm in and there's some parameters to my being in. Yeah. Yeah, because I am opening up to the vessel to co-create, like creating that container together with spirit. I'm a yes to that. Yeah. Well, and, and that's interesting too, just listening to your language, because a lot of people talk about being the vessel. What you talked about was creating the vessel, right? Which is, a, again, it's a, it's a slightly different thing. It's not, I'm empty, come fill me. Yeah. It's, let's create an emptiness so that something new can grow in it. And that's, that feels more true to me. Yeah. Well, and it feels more true to, to what I know of spirit. You know, there's a, there's a funny joke. I don't even remember where I heard this originally, but, um, guys on his knee, knees praying and he says, God, I, you know, I just need more. I need more money. I need like, you know, I'm not able to take care of like the basics in my life. You've got to help me. And God says, well, you know, I need a little help helping you go buy a lottery ticket. So it's like that idea of, it's not just like, you know, boom, here it is. It's what actions are we taking to allow different things to happen, to allow shift to occur. Mm. Um, I, I think that the idea of, of action is so important. You know, you see a lot of people setting intentions without any action. Yeah. Like, I'm going to set an intention and wait. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, you keep waiting. <laughs> my surrender looks different than that because I am so action oriented that my innate mode is to push when I should pause. Ah, 
Yeah. So you're creating stillness. I am. And that's part of that idea around the surrender for me, right? Is um, not having to know all the things. Yeah. Just one step. That's your lawyer brain. I want the outline. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And in that dance between the masculine and the feminine, you know, I need that masculine structure. But I don't want to rigidly hold on to it to the detriment of the action being inspired action rather than just action for action's sake. Yes. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm just thinking about some things that came up in my business in the past week. And I finally called my team and I said, yo, we are being reactive. You know, we had like, we had taken the time to really lay out what needed to be coming next and to really like take time and dive in. And then, you know, life started happening as it does. And we started reacting. And I think that sometimes it's easier to see it in something like a business because you do make a plan at the beginning of the year and then you can see, Mm -hmm. you know, how you're deviating or not. Um, but I think we do this in our lives too. You know, we, we hit in, we tap into this deep place where we feel guided and we know what's next. And it's one step, one step, one step, but we can get to this other thing. That's this reactionary, you know, this happens, then this happens, then this happens. And we don't pause. And all of a sudden we're so far from where we thought we wanted to be. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) I've been there. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Um, It's, it's almost like adhering to the linear, to the detriment of all else. (laughs) Yeah. And, and I think some of it too is thinking that action is needed. Mm. Like a lot of times no action is needed. You know, I'm, I'm a trained herbalist. And one of the things that, um, we're taught as herbalists is your first step. And I think Susan Weed was the person who came up with this originally. Um, your first step in assessing a situation is do nothing. And so, you know, I've talked about this with students over the years. Like, what does do nothing look like if you witness a car accident? Well, that do nothing phase might last for four seconds or one second. It might be a very short period of time. But you need that, you know, you had us do three breaths, right, before we started. And you're like, I love doing three breaths. It's the same thing. It's that moment of pause. What is the right action in this moment? instead of just acting. And, you know, I wish someone had taught me that younger (laughs) because (laughs) because the habit that's ingrained is just act. And so I'm always fighting that, right? I wish that the habit that was ingrained was pause. Mm. Yeah. I, I feel like I've like, we started to remember that here in my 40s, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's the think before you speak. It, that's the same thing. You know, and and we don't even we don't even like that. Like I I'm just remembering times where I would ask my husband something and I wouldn't be in the same room with him, right? So I'd be hollering something into the other room. And then there'd be silence. And eventually I'd stick my head into the room that he was in and say, well, did you hear me? And he'd be like, yeah, I'm thinking. (laughs) Right? (laughs) We're we're just so not used to that. It's like I spoke and now you speak. That's how a conversation goes. Not I speak and then you pause. I think our husbands may be similar. And one of the (laughs) things that – One of the things that has been um, really beautiful for our relationship is I think and process really quickly. So I then snap, 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 think I want him to do that with me. And so I was demanding that of him all the time. Yes. And that's not the way in which he works. Right. So we dance differently 
than that. So it comes to me, I maybe say it as a way of starting the conversation that I'd like to have in a couple of days. So I give him a chance. Right. And I do the same thing now. It sounds like we've both kind of come to the same lesson. I kind of do the, hey, by the way, think about this. Yep. (laughs) We'll get back to it. Um, But one of the things that I've realized about myself, and I don't know if you're the same way, I'm very much what I call an extroverted thinker, which means I don't know what color my thoughts are until they hit the air. Yes. Right? So it's like I have to extract them from my brain, and then I can look at them. And so what I found that's interesting is people like Andrew, my husband, by the time he speaks something, he's thought it out. He's there. It's pretty much a done deal. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. I, I speak to see what those thoughts look like. And I might speak and be like, oh, wow. Yeah, no, not that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Part of that, too, in learning to to dance with each other in rhythm is that then if I do need a decision on something right now, I can say that, too, now, because I'm not asking for that all the time and, like, basically putting a lot of static in his energy system on a regular basis. So then if I'm like, hey, I've I've screwed up and waited too long to talk to you about this. I need it. We need to make a decision on this one right now. He yes. can step into that place with me now because I'm not asking him to basically get on my energy system and run with it all the time. Right. And well, you're also presenting right up front what you need. Yeah. You're not assuming that he's ready for that right now. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I, I don't have the full thought yet, but I'm, I'm listening to us and I'm thinking about this concept of, co-creating as like the, the step above mere surrender. And I think this is, you know, like this is how we learn to co-create. Um, this is how we learn to dance. I'm, I'm a person who never wanted to be married. Mm-hmm. It's just the whole institution felt very um, mm, patriarchal. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't something that was in my, in my life plan. And, and I realized that, you know, I was perfectly happy to stay with Andrew without the marriage. Like it's not the marriage that makes this dance at the same time the the dance is so important because it's a co-creation. And I think that anytime we can like model co-creation for ourselves, it teaches us how to co-create with the universe, with spirit, with, you know, the great mother, however you want to think about that. Um, So like the lessons from co-creating with your, with your business partner, with your life partner, you know, with your child, with your best friend, these, these all are lessons that we can then apply to co-create spirit. Yeah. You touched on something earlier, um, (laughs) that around this priestessing idea and, for some reason, this morning in the shower, it hit me um, some of what's gone on in the arenas in which you and I play around the priestessing is this idea. It's become a little hierarchical, you know, where like there's this high priestess and and all of this. And what came in this morning was you're your own high priestess, high priestess for yourself. And yet we're coming together in moments of co-creation with each other to activate that within ourselves. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's, you know, it's really interesting. I think that one of the changes that people are going to talk about, you know, a hundred years from now, like it's too soon. We're in it. We can't quite see it yet is the move from organized religion to individual spirituality. And, you know, I think that the question with that is, how we can be in these spaces of individual spirituality where we are not counting on someone else to interpret spirit for us. Um, and yet still be in a place where we are aware of the greater whole and not stepping into a place of individual ego. And, you know, that's, that's the dance. I think that those of us who are deeply in this. So when I hear you say, you know, we come together for these activations. Um, 
it's interesting to me because on the one hand, I think, yes, there's something that happens when we circle up, when we, right? And even going back to the Bible, I never remember how, how many have to be gathered in his name. But, you know, Jesus said that like a certain number of people have to be gathered. Is it two or three? I, you know, so there is something about um, like the mass mind, mm-hmm. right? When people gather and put their energy to the same thing. And then on the other hand, I've learned so much from aloneness and stepping beyond the feeling of loneliness when out in the landscape. You know, I've learned so much from the trees and the mountains and the rivers and the oceans um, in that moment of being able to step beyond. And that's an activation as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are, you know what I mean? I think that like these are rites of passage and we still need rites of passage, even if they aren't dictated by an overarching religious structure and they come in different ways. And they aren't a linear recipe. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think when you're talking about individual spirituality, there's some, there's a, there's a being really clear that we're not talking about lone wolfing it. Right. Or, you know, being the lone wolf and I can do this on my own. No, we need each other. We are walking each other home. Well, that's interesting because on the one hand, I want to get, I want to cheer with you. I want to be like, yes, Um, because I've seen amazing things happen in circle. And, you know, my year in Ireland was so much about being alone. And so when, like, I think that if you can kind of expand that we're walking each other home to include, you know, all of creation, the four legs and the winged ones, Mm -hmm. you know, like then, then yes. But I've had some of my greatest lessons, not from a human, but from, you know, a rock. Yes. Yeah. Very good clarification there. Cause yeah, it's not just human to human, but I think because of our culture, we want to be really clear around It's not about doing it alone. Right. With with a small ego mind. Yeah, that's it. It's the ego piece. Mm -hmm. It's not the aloneness. It's the ego piece. You know, because the aloneness, I think, can actually help you step beyond the human experience and help you step onto the web of creation that includes, you know, the Hawthorne tree and the giant standing stone and like all these, all these pieces of the larger web. And so if you can step out of your ego and onto that web, that's what it takes. But I think like when I hear the word that it's, when I hear it, it's not about being alone. Um, that's slightly different to me than the ego piece, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. Um, and I think what I'm really speaking to is not coming through that wounded lens of standing alone as an individual and striving, you know? Yes. Yeah. That there's yeah. communion with this bigger web, spirit, other beings, yes. are they human or not? <laughs> yes. Yes. Now I can get behind it and give a big old yes. Yeah, yeah no, right? and it's but these are important conversations around pulling pulling this apart. And being mindful with our with our words because I think that sometimes um we use words a little like a little inaccurately. We can be a little sloppy and then we don't realize that we're not actually conveying what we think we're conveying. <laughs> So just being, you know, words have power, right? That's another very old lesson. You go back to the Kabbalah and, you know, so many of our spiritual texts tell us that words have power. And so picking through the choices like we just did and finding the word that we can kind of put out into the world so that other people understand the concept that we're working on. Yeah. Yeah. And if you were wondering what Maya was talking about around extroverted thinking, that's what we just did. <laughs> that's what we just did. That's it. Yeah. yeah. That kind of, you know, let's get it out of ourselves 
so that we can tease the threads apart and really, really look at it. Yeah. And find what resonates as truth for us. And sometimes it takes, I think for me, like it takes that digging through it, you know, has this happened to you? I'm, I'm a writer. So I, you know, I have my first book coming out this summer and words are so important to me. So I'm always like the words are always kind of flowing. And sometimes I'll be out for a walk and I will get like a sentence and I will think it is brilliant. You know, I'll, I'll be like writing it down, recording it in my phone, trying to scratch it on my arm with my fingernail so I don't forget it. And then I get home and I look at it again and I'm like, hold it. Did I write that down wrong? Like, where's the brilliant sentence? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's part of that like extroverted thinking is like you just have to get it out and then revisit it. Yeah. And a lot of it's schlock. You know what I mean? Like a lot of the thoughts that have to come out of my mouth are schlock until I really like look at them, polish them. Um, clear away the extra debris and get to what what needs to be said. Yeah. And my husband has a very deep precision of words and I tend not to. I tend to be sloppy. Yeah. I think I think you and I are those extroverted thinkers. Like we spit it out and then we mm -hmm. polish it as opposed to polishing it in our brains. Yeah. There's, it's almost like there's too much going on quickly in there to do a lot of the processing. It needs to like splat. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, and then there's, there, then there's this other thing that happens um, when I'm kind of in liminal space where I'm like channeling stuff, the right words just come and then I can like, I can't repeat them. I can't write them down. People are always wanting me to give them a ritual. I can't give someone a ritual, you know, like they channel through me and then they're, they're gone. Hmm. Yeah. Sometimes I even rhyme, which I think is, is like ridiculous. Like, I, you know, when I'm doing ritual, yeah. I rhyme. Huh. Yeah. You're a ritual rapist. <laughs> <laughs> ritual rapper. <laughs> I am. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. And like, if I try to do it on purpose, it doesn't happen. But yeah, if I'm just in flow weird it's i mean it's very weird oh my it's like God. i'm channeling some some dorky fantasy writer that's brilliant <laughs> yeah and that circles us back because that's a surrendering to co-creation right there right yes it is. that's that that's that dance yeah mm. yeah my love, are you ready for the random questions? How random are they? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Super random. Um, random is me. <laughs> so can you tell us in this moment what's your favorite herb or plant to be playing with? You know, I'm, I'm actually playing with, with CBD a lot, which is uh -huh. a marijuana extract. Um not a plant that I have spent a lot of time with until the past year. Um, so yeah, it's been really interesting, like stepping into that relationship. Um, it, I think that there are some plants that are teacher plants and if you respect them, you can learn a lot and, and, you know, marijuana, ayahuasca, those plants fall into this category for me of, of teacher plants. So um, this isn't one I've, I've danced with before and I'm kind of fascinated, you know, kind of fascinated to, to learn this, like, okay, how can I be in this respectful relationship, um, that allows me to learn and not like abuse the plant or abuse the relationship. Yeah. I, I think the plants you're talking about, marijuana, ayahuasca, you really have to enter with that intention of deep respect with those plants. That yeah. feels important. Yeah. There's, you know, there, there are certain plants that are kind of like, you know, your, your party girls, they're happy to talk to everybody. Um, I feel like, and I feel like people think marijuana is one of those plants, but it's really not, you know, it's, it's really actually more like your loner in the corner 
who has some shit to tell you if you'll sit down and be still for a few minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gorgeous. Which this is really interesting. This is um, my book that's coming out this summer mm-hmm. is giving, giving voice in this way to the plants um, and just letting like their individual personalities really speak out. So it's some of my friends who, who are also herbalists have said, oh, wow, this is not a beginner book. And then my friends who don't know anything about plants are like, this is great. They're just like characters in a movie. Um, I feel like I can get to know them. So it's it's been really fun to find the personalities of the plants in that way. Oh, so they can speak to everyone on whatever level. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the illustrations are amazing. So I'm really looking forward to kind of seeing it all put together. Mm, and it has been long in the making. It has been long in the making. So um, I, I looked back, the first email was December of 2014. Mm-hmm. And so we're in 2018 now. The book comes out August. I keep forgetting whether it's the 2nd or the 7th. I think it's the 7th yeah. of this year. I think it's important to talk about how long things can be in the making because when they hit the scene, it feels like it, there's a bit of a splash. And so there's, you know, yeah, people think like, Oh, this just happened or this happened quickly. It was an incredibly long road to get this book done. And I'm totally happy to, to share if you think your listeners might want to hear, I don't know if you think you have authors, authors or people who want to be authors out there, but I also don't want to bore people. I, I think the I think the feeling of um, letting the process be what it is, regardless if you're writing a book, whatever it is that you're creating, is just an important thing to touch on. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the things that I've learned through this process is creation is is not circling back a singular thing. Um. Yeah you know, I'm working with a whole team of people. And by the time everyone's done their process, it takes a little while. Like I'm in process for my second book and there's all these different people who have to get hands on and put their opinion in and put their numbers together and put their ideas together um, before we can move along. Yeah. And it just takes time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. The second random question is, do you have a favorite phase of the moon? Mm, I would say no. Uh (laughs) You know, um, yeah, I think visually I love a very thin crescent, Mm. you know, like I, I, like I love walking outside and kind of finding the thin crescent all tangled up in the tree branches. Um, so that's that's always lovely. And of course, I love the full moon because you can you can walk outside without any other lights, which is for me just such an incredible reminder of our primal roots. Oh. You know, right? That the full moon night was a night that people actually um went out and sometimes harvested or like worked in the garden. Um it's also on a very traditional like moon cycle, menstrual cycle, when people would be out and about and possibly um, doing that co-creation dance. Yeah. You know, right? So, you know, I think that the, the full moon has some lovely reminders built in. And then being a huge fan of the darkness, I love how dark it is on the new moon. You know, I, I like... I, I love when you're in a place where like you can't see your hand when you hold it up in front of your face. And I don't like it when I'm in an, an enclosed space and feel that, but like when I'm outside and it's that dark, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Maya, thank you. Can you let us know how we reach out and connect with you? Absolutely. So the very best way to, you know, know what's going on in my world is to head over to my website, which is M-A-I-A-T-O-L-L, Maya Toll.com. 
Um, and if you misspell it, I have redirects on almost every misspelling of my name. <laughs> <laughs> You're adorable. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, you can sign up right there to get my, my regular Sunday emails. And that's the best way to know what's going on. Uh, I also have a store called Herbiary and we're online and we have a shop in Philadelphia and in Asheville. So I don't really hang out at the store so much. Um, but it's a great way to kind of, you know, touch in and see what I'm, I'm up to in, in the background because, I'm involved in helping to choose things and like what goes into the store and the flavor of the store is part of my co-creation with my partner. Yeah. I mean, when you stand in Herbiary, you are infused into that space. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what we're going for. <laughs> you've, you've nailed it. <laughs> Even infusion. That's what I want. <laughs> Shannon, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Thank you. Hello again, everyone. I so enjoyed being with Maya. The fertile conversations around surrender and co-creation have sent me on new paths and open up new ways of thinking for me, which is really awesome. Uh, along with the idea of extroverted thinking, I'm getting to know myself a little better through that. So I thank Maya very deeply for coming together with me to play and to share herself with us. If you would like to deepen in with Maya, you can go over to the show notes for this episode at honorthefeminine.com. In 2018, I have a desire to deeply connect. And a couple of ways to do that with me are in our community space on Facebook at Honor the Feminine Rhythm, where we talk about how we each can stand more fully in our power, share our voices, express our truth. So I'd love for you to join me there at Honor the Feminine Rhythm on Facebook. Also, I am loving Instagram right now, and it's been a really beautiful place to connect with many people. So you can get me on Instagram at Honor the Feminine. I'm just loving it as a playful place to show up on a regular basis. And finally, one of the ways to stay connected is to subscribe to the podcast. It's also a way by subscribing to the podcast and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, you can help me reach um, women, more amazing women on the journey to honor themselves and the feminine. So uh, it takes all of us working together to be on this journey. All right. Have a beautiful day.